I talk more about this consensus, and, and in fact, I will not talk about really besides the consensus, okay, beyond the consensus. Um, uh, just for you to understand wh who, uh, what I do, I'm not from the blockchain community, okay? Uh, I'm an academic, so I worked on, I started working on Byzantine replication in 2002, when I started my, my PhD, and then I had several contributions, some better than others, uh, and um, I also worked a lot on work a lot on multi-cloud storage, and uh, more recently on security monitoring using machine learning and these things. But today I'll be talking about my main topic, and probably the thing I know a, a bit better than the others, than the other than the other things I know, not the other people, <laughs> which is the BFT replication, BFT consensus, and so on, and even more recently applications to to blockchain. Okay, so for this talk. I got this picture that is quite common in, in, in blockchain. Probably Christian uses that now. Um, what I'm, I'm considering here as a blockchain, uh, to more or less generalize thing, is just a general ledger uh, on top of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, um, and uh, based on that, or on this very gen general and abstract idea. We have two main models. There are more, but there are people that uh, define more, uh, based on subtleties, on the way it is deployed, define more ways. But I, I think technologically, you can think about two main models. One is the public open ledgers, like you have, what we have in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many others, based on proof of work, quite important. And I, I would say the main characteristic is that everyone can participate on this network, so you don't need strong identities. And then you have the permissioned or private ledgers or consortium ledgers or whatever name people are doing this day, are giving these days. Uh, it's also called a distributed ledger technology. And in this case, the, the big difference is that peers have a strong verifiable identity. So not everyone can participate on this. You need, you need to be part of this group of peers that um, will be providing this uh, blockchain or supporting this, the, the execution of this blockchain. Um, one of the big advantages here is that if you have these identities, you can use classical Byzantine consensus. It might be an advantage or not, but in, in theory, at least in terms of performance, you'll be better than what you have in this proof of work, proof of stake, or proof of whatever uh, protocols. Um, an observation, observation I like to make about this is that when you try to compare these technologies, besides the fact that they are both called blockchains or ledgers, uh, in fact, they are quite different. Uh, these public open ledgers are more related with peer-to-peer -peer systems, BitTorrent. Many design ideas came from this arena, where in these private or permissioned ledgers, you are more closer to distributed database. Okay, so the concerns are different. The the, the performance level that you aim is different, and uh, the security model maybe is more is different also. Uh, but in the end, you want to provide this uh, ledger that cannot be modified, that, that you can store facts about um, well, your application, being it a cryptocurrency or other. In this talk, I'll be talking only about this, OK? We already had many talks about the, the open ledger, so, uh, and I, I probably don't know sufficiently to, to talk about this. And um, I'll start talking about two or three, um, or two, um, permission ledgers, OK? I guess. Christian will be talking more about this later, but uh, just to give you a uh, bit of context, one of them, and one of the that's getting a lot of momentum, is Hyperledger Fabric. This is an open source, modular, permissioned uh, blockchain. Um, if I had to define that for you in one single uh, statement, it would be that not all peers are equal. So you have different types of peers, and uh, in particular, you have a, a small, or relatively small number of peers that do execute consensus. And all the others just run the, not just, they run the smart contract, they keep the ledger, and so on. So um, you have a membership control here uh, that, that certifies who can participate in this system or not. Uh, it's used in, there are many business cases, so if you are interested in why people use it, you should look on the internet about, but it's basically a lot of companies that want to remove um, redundant validations and uh, accounting from from their applications. Um, how this works, okay? At high level, so imagine this is at the time passing, okay, and different types of peers, or, uh, yeah, peers participating in the system. You have the client, the client wants to execute some smart contract. 
it creates a transaction, send it to what we call endorsing peers. These endorsing peers are the guys that run the smart contract, which here is called a chain code. Chain codes can be written in any language, can integrate with uh, any, any kind of system, whatever. It's, it's just uh, uh, um, some service that you, you run. And then it, it executes the, the transaction and creates an endorsement with write and read sets. What was modified in the a kind of database they have in this, in this model. Then it sends back to the client. The client collects this. This is the, 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 the transaction and the outcome of the transaction. And then it sends it to the ordering service. This ordering service is the one that do the consensus, okay? You can see here, we are separating the, 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 the nodes. The, of course, all these demons can run in the same uh, machines if you want, but uh, generally it's expected to be in a different part. Um, the ordering service can be a single node, can be multiple nodes, can, can be implemented in different ways. In fact, this is one of the interesting ideas of um, Fabric. You can have different ordering nodes for different applications, okay? And then in the end, it accumulates transactions and generate blocks. And the blocks are sent back to peers that validate the outcome of the transactions and add the block to the blockchain. So the blockchain is maintained here. Um, if we go really inside here, because it's what interests us, I think, uh, the ordering cluster is basically uh, a bunch of replicas that, or imagining a fault-tolerant ordering cluster, right? It's a bunch of replicas that in which you have clients that generate a workload, that have a, a workload, that how many transactions they generate per second. Uh, each of these transactions has a different size, and the size will influence the performance. And then they accumulate several of these transactions, and when you have, for example, 100 transactions, it spit a block, okay? And this block is sent to the front ends, which is basically the peers uh, that you want. Um, if you have a big network, you don't need to send to all the peers. You can send to some of them, and then they uh, lazily disseminate to the others in the network. But here, let's simplify this. So if we, for those of you that understand a bit of replication, in this case, you have some state. It appears that you just order transactions and then generate blocks. But in fact, um, you have some state that you, you need to keep consistent in this cluster, okay? Um, the order transactions, there are some order transactions that are not yet in blocks, so you need to be, to be sure that you have, all the replicas have the same group of transactions. Um, you need to, to store the header of the last generated block because you want to create the next one, and you have to add the hash to make it a blockchain. And uh, the last configuration block, this is specific about um, Fabric. Um, but pretty much this is where the consensus will be uh, executed in, in this cluster size to ensure that all the, these nodes order the requests and generate blocks that match one another. Okay, so they generate blocks in, in agreement. Another uh, permission ledger that I will mention to you, uh, and this is a quite different one, is Corda. Corda is a permission ledger from R3. Uh, I don't know if it's a company or an organization or whatever, but it's related with the financial uh, market and financial. Uh, sorry? I think it's the opposite. No, it's the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Corda is the software, basically, but it's, a, it's an open source project in the end, okay? Um, so I think the key idea about Corda is that it is not really a blockchain, uh, as we are interested. Uh, there is no shared global ledger. Instead, what they do is they, they do it in a more peer-to-peer -peer way. There are, there are ledgers between pairs of peers, pairs of group or groups of peers. And in these ledgers, they store facts that the peers agreed. For example, this... These two guys, Alice and Bob, uh, have, some, have a shared ledger with facts that the both of them know. In this case, we have facts that are shared between Ed, Carl, and Demi, okay? So this is how it works. It doesn't have a single global ledger that everyone uh, writes on. So in, in many cases, they argue that this is more um, um, useful for, for uh, business and because of confidentiality requirements and so on. Um, the idea here is that only the involved participants in some transactions have to execute and validate the transaction. So if I'm transferring money 
from A to B, only A and B needs to know about this transaction, okay? Uh, and the transaction is considered committed only if uh, it achieves what they call validity consensus, which means that everyone that is working, that, that, that is involved in these transactions, needs to sign it, needs to understand and sign it. And uh, there's this uniqueness consensus, for example, to deal with double spending, okay? If I want to spend something, uh, I have to ensure that I spend that only once. And then it comes what they call the notary service. Okay? Each piece of state, and the piece of state can be a coin, uh, it's associated with a notary. And the notary is the guy that stores, okay, this was already spent. Or maybe it's, um, you have some, some uh, car that you want to sell, it says this car is not yours anymore. You already sold it to someone. Uh, it doesn't matter the application, but this guy stores, it's, it's a notary, it stores all the state that was already spent and creates another one um, with the follow-up of the transaction, okay? And as you can see, this notary is a single point of failure. So where, where consensus is used here, you replicate this notary and this uh, is basically a key value store that you only append things. So the notary is probably what is closer to a, to a ledger, but you can have multiple notaries in a cordon network. So it, it gets more complicated. But, but the, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot claim that I, I fully understand it. Um, but anyway, what's important here is that you have a set of nodes. They, they need to generate blocks or confirm the validity of certain transactions. And these nodes, in the end, what they do is implement what we call a state machine replication. Okay? You have a bunch of servers. These servers um, receive transactions from, from clients okay, or from peers. This, any, this, what these servers ensure is that if one of the servers uh, execute transaction one and then transaction two, and execute means whatever we want, um, in the, some of these cases, just put these transactions on the block, okay? They don't really execute the transaction, just put it on the block. All the servers will execute these transactions in the same order, okay? This is what people call consensus. So state machine replication uh, is more or less used uh, call it consensus or it's called total order broadcast or multicast. And I think this is the, the most correct name for, because what we are doing here is really ordering transactions, okay? But in fact, these two problems are equivalent. Uh, and the main, the main properties that you want, ah, of course, and in the end, uh, since the nodes can be malicious, can give you wrong results, you have some kind of voting. So the clients will vote on the outputs to see if it was done by a certain number of replicas. I can't confirm the result, otherwise I have to throw it away. There are two properties here. All replicas execute the same sequence of transactions, and transactions issued by correct clients or honest clients will be executed, okay, or will get answered. And uh, we've been working for many years on a replication library that, that tries to implement this model, okay. This is called BFT Smart, so we started it in 2010, published a paper in 2014, um, it's written in Java, and uh, the idea here is that uh, it was designed around a Byzantine fault-tolerant protocol, so it needs 3F plus 1 replicas. This is important. For those of you that don't understand or don't uh, never look at a, a lot about these classical Byzantine protocols, instead of having the 51% or the, the computational power bound, here the, our bound is on the number of nodes. So you need a certain number of nodes to tolerate a certain number of malicious nodes. So in this case, I need, for example, 10 nodes to tolerate three malicious nodes, okay? And this is pre-established. There, there are variations of this, but this 3F three, three plus 1 is a, more or less a magical, a magical number in, in BFT replication. And the protocol works like this. And looking on it, uh, you can see it's not very scalable. So here for four replicas, 10, 15, 20, it will work, okay? But uh, if you imagine all these masters running around 6,000 replicas, it will not, like in, in, in Bitcoin, it will not work at all. Uh, but the basic idea is that there is always a leader. The leader proposes uh, the order of the masters, and the other, two, the other replicas will confirm that the leader, what the leader is proposing makes sense. The leader is not trying to fool the, 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 the other nodes. Um, let's take a look, I, I'll not go in detail on this, uh, but let's take a look on the performance of this thing, okay? 
Um, here you can see um, the number of transactions ordered per second and uh, in thousand. So we can see here 80,000 uh, transactions per second. If you compare that with the Bitcoin or blockchain numbers, especially for open systems, it's not really, it's, it's orders of magnitude higher. This is uh, higher than what you have in most databases. Uh, but the thing here is that it's not doing anything. It's just ordering, OK? Uh, and you can see here, when I use more replicas, so I, here I have four, then uh, seven, then 10. This decreases, but doesn't, doesn't decrease a lot. Uh, the two bars, one is because I'm tolerating only crashes or Byzantine failures. Um, what's really important here is that you can see changes a lot is when I change the size of the transaction, okay? These numbers below the graphs are the request size or the size of the transaction and the size of the reply of the transaction. So you can get, maybe you can focus on only this, oops, only this and this. And you can see that increasing the number of replicas from four to 10 changes, but doesn't change a lot. But increasing the size of a transaction from zero bytes, so it's a one, two bytes, to 1K decreases it a lot, okay? So this kind of system is very uh, sensible to the size of the transaction. And I would, I would argue that this is probably the most important factor affecting the performance of it. But of course, we are talking here, even in this case, we are talking about 15, 20,000 operations per second. It is still much faster than whatever uh, public blockchain that we are used to, to use. But my main point in this talk is that I want to, to give you an idea is that consensus is not enough, OK? So we can have this ordering. It will order transactions. It can be fit. In fact, both uh, BFT Smart was used at least on prototype implementations for both Hyperledger Fabric and Corda to implement this fault tolerance on the, on the components I showed you. Uh, but only the, having the transaction or the, the consensus protocol is not enough. You need other features. For example, you need durability. Everything you do needs to go to disk because if the machines go down, you have to uh, get the state back where you were before. This sounds na natural to you, but there's, there are many papers on the subject that just ignore this, okay? Uh, because they assume that there are at most F failures and they are proved correct under this bound. But in practice, uh, bad luck, don't respect bounds. So you can have problems. You can have uh, the, all, all the machines can crash, and then you get the disks, put, put it back. Then you have recovery. Some machines can go down, and then they need to, to be restarted and resynced with the system. And you have also the reconfiguration. So just to give an idea, if I have a system like this that I show with you, with four kilobyte transactions, so you have big transactions, so imagine you have a, here, I think this is probably close to the size of transactions on Hyperledger Fabric, if you are considering a non-trivial application. Uh, if you do everything in memory, it will, allows you to do around 4,000, 4, almost 5,000 operations per second. And if suddenly I say, OK, I, I just want to write this to disk to ensure that if I crash, I can recover and get these transactions back. Uh, if I do a synchronous write, which means that I write on the, I, I call the, the operating systems to write to disk, but the operating system will write it when it uh, sees an opportunity for doing that. I do not lose a lot. This is just the context switching from the application to the kernel. But if I try to do a synchronous write, so I stop the system, write to the disk, and then I go back to the system and answer the client, then my performance is really, really bad. Okay. This is the kind of problem that is not um, discovered by us. The database community fight with this problem a lot. Uh, and if you, if you get the idea that, okay, but I can do this with not disks, but uh, SSDs to improve also a bit, but not, this is still, there's a huge gap on that. Okay. So doing this uh, is also very important, and you have to be aware if the, the solution that people are considering are right into disk, and that's why you, know, you never get the, in the production and in the papers the same numbers, OK? Then the state transfer is a bit more uh, uh, tricky, the problem. One replica crashes, 
Imagine you have this group of three replicas. It's not even BFT. It's only tolerated, tolerating crashes. One replica crashes, and then it recovers. Okay. One important thing about this protocol is that you need a quorum uh, executing operations to ensure that the system will work. In this case, these two replicas are ordering transactions. But then suddenly, someone came back. And this someone that was here before, but now it's not, wants the state. He lost some transactions. He wants to resynchronize with the system. And then it asks for the state. There are two problems here. To order transactions very fast, we need two replicas operating on the same pace. Uh, in this case, there will be one working, ordering, one that is available for ordering transactions. One will be ordering transactions, but we will also be splitting its power to help other replica resync. And the last one is stop it because it, for all, all that matters, it is not in the system yet. It, I mean, it's in the system, but it's considered faulty because it doesn't have the state, the correct state. And then if you look on what happens in terms of performance, it will be something like this, OK? Uh, during the state transfer, um, the system will uh, stop. You have to remember that most of these, um, maybe if you are thinking about open blockchains and the kind of performance that we are using, it's not really a big problem, this, OK? But if you think about distributed ledger technology, we are Companies are trying to use that many, in many cases to substitute database or to go in the, to applications that are used to have to be to be used with database. Okay, so you have to be aware of this, and uh, this is a problem of general state machine. About reconfiguration, I could show you the, the results, but it's not really important. What's really important about reconfiguration is that, in general, reconfiguring state machine replication is a protocol that I can explain to you in 30 seconds. You basically stop the system, run a consensus saying, these are the number of replicas, now I have these, these replicas. But then when you try to, to fit this protocol on the code, you basically change the assumptions everywhere. Okay? You, start, you modify the quorums, but this is more or less simple. But then you have a lot of things that you can put in the system. I have this graph that I use it to, <laughs> to show uh, once in a while about what you can have in, when you try to implement these state machine replication protocols. And uh, this is mostly for the last decade that you can, to get an accept, accepted paper, uh, you had just to show high performance uh, on a prototype. And then on the PhD, probably you implement leader change, at least uh, parts of it. For production level, you need at least recovery because the number of replicas hepica, go down and then you need to bring back to the system. But then reconfiguration is really something that changes a lot. And uh, in BFT Smart, we implemented these things through the years. Uh, some of them, and in particular, we, talk, we, we dealt with this problem of durability with a set, a set of techniques that I don't have time to explain. Uh, but what I, sh I would like to show you is that these numbers I showed before, so, oops, sorry, 63 uh, transactions per second when I use a disk, or 1,000 when I use SSD, and uh, almost 5,000 when I have uh, memory, pure memory, can be worked on if you are smart in the way you do logging, okay, in, which you, in the way you log your operations. Basically, you can get uh, your disk and SSD be, get very close to the memory. Uh, of course, the latency of disks, you cannot do magic, right? Uh, the disk is an electromechanical device. You have to wait for it. But in terms of throughput, we have to observe that disks um, are slow but they are very good in terms of throughput. They can receive a lot of data uh, at once. And writing one byte or 10 kilobyte is more or less the same thing for them, or even more, OK? And uh, somewhat interesting, here we are, we are using good disks and good SSDs. And what you can see here that disks are even better than SSDs by a bit. And we run some uh, uh, ben disk benchmark, and we saw that the throughput of the disks were better. In the end, what we, BFT Smart does, and this is something that we are very proud, is that it works under sporadic events. Okay? Here you see the time passing and a lot of things will happening. So in this case, a new replica enters in the group. So you have more replicas, you have more masters, then the throughput goes down. Then the leader crashes, so the current leader stops. This is the timeout value. The system will stop for a bit. 
and then it will elect a new leader and it takes over and continue working. Then the old leader recovers. Now we have again five replicas. So the system, the throughput goes back, goes down a bit again. And in the end, one of the replicas removed it from the group. Okay. Um, so consensus itself is being executed uh, for all, ordering all these things. But dealing with all these events uh, is what really uh, makes these things robust and uh, to be used in a production, or at least to be considered, okay? Because in fact, uh, to the best of my knowledge, VFT Smart is not being used in production. And I don't know if it should be. <laughs> but uh, what I can see is that, to the best of my knowledge, there are no bugs there. I don't know any bug that is still to be corrected. Um, going back to Hyperledger, just to conclude, uh, we implemented these ordering nodes following the, the mechanisms that are required for the system. And then what, what happens that we reach these results, okay? This is the throughput, it's thousand of transactions per second for different sizes. Uh, and this is the number of peers that will be receiving the block. So for example, let's consider, let's talk about only about the last, the last number here, which is 32. So there, it means that there are the orders plus 32 peers in the network that will be receiving the block after it's generated. Um, you can see here, when you have big transactions, which is closer to the practical setting, uh, the throughput is more or less the same because the bottleneck is the consensus protocol. But when you have slow, oh, slow sorry, small messages, the throughput suffers a lot on the block generation because you have to send big blocks to a lot of people. No, not big blocks, but blocks that are much bigger than the requests. <laughs> I mean, the system is very good in ordering small things. And maybe this informs if the hyperledger uh, fabric is aims to aim to um, have high performance or a performance comparable with database and something. They need to work on trying to, to order transactions off, not not order transactions, order maybe metadata of the transactions, not the whole transactions. Uh, but probably we will reach this point at <laughs> in, in some time. Um, and that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any. Yeah. Ah, one thing I said. Here's with four nodes, four ordering nodes, ten nodes. So um, you can see the the problem is the size of the transactions, like I I told you before. Um, so to conclude, uh, what, what I I think just to give you, especially for people here involved in some research. What I think are the, the really interesting research and development agenda for this kind of protocols for permissioned ledgers. Uh, of course, I will not talk about permissioned ledgers and how they interact with applications and so on, because I, I don't have this, this knowledge, but about the consensus protocol and the, the things that we need to do related to this. There's this, we need this re robust BFT replication, okay? So it, it doesn't matter if you do something for a paper, but you have uh, to try to correct bugs and maintain it for some time, because it's very difficult to have this code, this is short, it's less than 2,000 uh, lines of, uh, 20,000 lines of code, uh, but the code, some parts are very, very complicated. Then there's geo-replication. Geo-replication is fundamental because it's the key for implementing distributed trust. If you put all the replicas in the same cluster, the cluster goes down, it's, it's over. Then there's scalability and elasticity. Um, this goes for partitioning or scalable protocols and so on. Then there's this topic about diversity and fault independence, which is something that uh, most of the community put aside and as just assume. But in practice, what happens is that it doesn't matter if I have a bound of failures, if an attacker, a clever attacker, with this find a single vulnerability that affects all the replicas. So if it affects all the replicas, it can bring down the whole network with a single attack. So uh, this is something that we are working on for several years and I hope to publish something soon. soon. Uh, but basically what you need here is to run the system with several operating systems and manage these operating systems and uh, other software stacks that you need. Uh, and last but not least, one of the things we are trying to do now is how to design a very simple blockchain platform. So the minimal set of chains that I have to do to get a state machine replication protocol and turn it on a, on a blockchain. Uh, of course, you can implement everything on application level. It's very simple. 
but uh, there are mechanisms that are um, redundant, like logging and logging again for the blockchain. Uh, the reconfiguration, the way it works in BFT Smart and in BFT in general, you need a trusted third party. So, but th there's are minor, minor issues if you are interested. I, uh, I can, individually they are minor issues, but together I think this co can make an interesting contribution. And that's it. Uh, I think I was more or less on time. <laughs> Do you, did you benchmark it against MinBFT, uh, BFT Smart? Against what? MinBFT. Um, so the comparison between BFT Smart and MinBFT, if MinBFT would use... Um, MinBFT is the one that to do uh, use the, the trusted component, right? Yeah, but if you... So did, did, do you not have a comparison between them? Uh, the problem is that uh, MinBFT was based on a very, very old version of BFT Smart. Okay. So... I would have to re-implement that now. There are papers from uh, Rudiger and some people from mm. Germany, yeah. and uh, they do that. I would say, if I had to approximate that, oh, sorry. <coughs> the comparison will be similar to this. Compare the crash fault tolerant with the... Yeah, because it's 2t plus 1 versus... Yes, because exactly. it's 2t plus 1, the... Yeah. the here, when we change to 2t two, two plus 1, we basically uh, implement exactly the same uh, message pattern of uh, MinBFT, but MinBFT there has a trusted component. So if it's fast to access the trusted component, yeah. as it appears today, it's much better. Yeah, yeah. When we did uh, MinBFT, it was a TPM. It was uh, terrible. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 saying, I'm asking also because there is an initiative for Hyperledger to donate MinBFT now ah, okay. with SGX. We can discuss it offline if you want. Oh, that's great. There also. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, a piece of trivia for what you referred about, uh, you talked about R3. Mm. So, they started as a Bitcoin company, downgraded to blockchain company because it was too heavy, whatever. <laughs> and then they went bankrupt, they died, and then they just reborn <laughs> with a BFT whatever idea. <laughs> So just a piece okay, of yeah. And uh, regarding your work, so you have been working on BFT, I know your research work, uh, for like 10, 15 years now and uh, with your supervisor. Uh, why do you think that all of a sudden because of, I guess, Bitcoin and whatever other blockchains we have now, it just, I think, resurfaced interest in uh, BFT work. I think it was pretty dead but for about 10 years. Uh, I think the problem is that it was dead because people always mis misplaced it. Uh, the systems community target co the completely wrong environment and try to, f try to fool others to, f to make this user uh, for cloud environment data center. This never worked and uh, it was not in the Castro and Discover original protocol. Uh, and uh, the, the thing was always about distributed trust. I think Christian put that uh, once. And uh, the thing is that you have to have several partners. And what we want is to, to implement a service that is more dependable than something centralized. Motivating the use of BFT for, because of memory corruption is just... Uh, uh, ridiculous. I'm not saying ridiculous, but <laughs> it's... it's, it's, it's in, uh, I don't know the word in Portuguese because in English is the opposite. Overkill? In general. Uh, Overkill? Naive. 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 <laughs> and if people buy, people do, who bought that, I thought it's an overkill also, but uh, my word was that. Because people who bought that, they didn't know what they are. Yeah. Because so the, the code yeah. is extremely complicated for just that. But by the way, I was surprised also. Uh, I, was, I still continued working on that, but I was looking more, my, my main agenda before that on working on this, where this is state machine replication. Uh, for BFT, I need to work on wide area replication. If, if it's for a cluster, it, it will not do anything. And BFT is smart, that's why it supports the two models. <coughs> so we wanted to make state machine replication and depends on your assumptions, we can go one side or another.
Thank you. <laughs>